our students so that they can benefit from the learning that we are participating in. So um, a couple things to highlight um, that I don't know if, if you've been able to see in the news. We, um, we did receive an award from the Department of Energy. It's kind of, kind of combined uh, Department of Energy, EPA, and um, Department of Education award. Um, for Efficient Healthy Schools program in two categories. There are only 15 districts, or 15 awards given in the whole country, so we scooped up two of them for this year, so that's exciting. Um, and we, yeah, so let's do this. Let's, let's, let's talk about it and let's do it. Uh, let's do the work, that's what we have to do. Um, we also did just um, receive uh, an award for our first electric school buses, so those will be, we're, there's a lot to figure out, but, um, we're in the process of trying to get the uh, designs of the charging infrastructure and the purchase orders for the buses. So those will replay, replace eight of our diesel buses. Um, and that's an EPA IRA funding. So the mayor mentioned this morning about um, the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure laws and the, the changes that are um, coming directly to both government organizations, nonprofits, as well as corporations. Um, to do this work, and so it sounds like the city's preparing some information sessions around that, and um, we've been working hard on that as a district to figure out how to tap into that as soon as possible. Um, some things that are I'm really proud of uh, as our district, we have um, this year started free breast breakfast for all students at all schools. So one of the things that we've needed to do is figure out how to make sure these efforts are equitable and, and remove stigma for accessing these programs, whether that's around food security or community health or any of the other programs. So the equity and access issue is critical as a school district and in our community. And we talk about that openly and we're proud of that. Um, we also did, uh, we are rebranding and have share tables at all of our schools now. So that means that, that it speaks to, um, she mentioned share tables as a solution at lunch, Dana did. Um, and so that's a program that um, we're working with EPA on to rebrand and, and try to help make sure that all the school food gets eaten and if kids are still hungry, they can get more food. Um, so that's, that's important for learning, but that's also a food waste reduction strategy. So it's a, it's a, double, it's a double win. Um, some other things that um, I'm most excited about are that we've added a green team leadership position at each school. So we have 52 schools, that's 4.6 million square feet of buildings. That's a lot of buildings. The built environment has an impact. We've needed to try to figure out how to measure that impact and we, we now have a carbon footprint, um, a greenhouse gas audit for each building and we're working with our students and all of their leaders to try to understand the opportunities that are maybe near term, low cost opportunities or the longer term um, kind of infrastructure switches that will need to happen. So we've, we're really moving into that space, but we're trying to do that as much as possible with our green team students. And I have three of them with us today. Um, and they're gonna speak about their background and what's bringing them to the work. And they're also gonna talk about the projects at their schools. And um, just so to give you kind of a sense of scale, we um, estimate based on survey from all the green team leads that we have 600 green team students that actively participated last year in year one. Um, so this is just three of the many from ages three all the way to graduates. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and we've estimated that they served 16,000 hours of service learning around the environment and climate um, in their school. So we think about it kind of in concentric circles of service to self, service to your family, service to your community or your school, and service to the world, service to the planet. These concentric layers of service opportunities. So I'm gonna ask each of the students to introduce themselves. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just start, we're just gonna go down the line and they'll tell you a little bit about what brings them to the work and also what kinds of things they're working on with their green teams or um, personally active here with our um, 18 and under representation. Um, and so we're gonna make sure that most of the time is, is um, spent just taking your questions from the youth perspective. Um, okay, so we, um, we'll start with Jisun. So Jisun is a, a senior at Timberline High School, and I'm gonna let her introduce herself and what brings her 
into this space and motivates her every day and the projects she's working on. Hey, thank you, Ali. Hello, everyone. My name is Jisong. Um, for what brings me to the work, that's pretty hard to like narrow it down to like I guess one answer. But I would say one of them is since I've grown up in like Boise, Idaho, for most of my life, like a lot of you, I am sure, like growing around like the foothills or like floating on the Boise River, hiking with my family and friends has just like fostered a really like big passion and love for the environment for me. Um, and then I think something really special about at least Boise's environment is how it brings our communities together. And that's something I kind of see a lot at my school's environmental club called Tree Club. Um, we have over 180 students in the club, which is pretty crazy. This year is like the biggest it's ever been. And it's really crazy that everyone in the club is from like every part of the school, like people who you would never see like coming to an environmental club meeting every Friday at lunch who is showing up because we all have that shared passion for the environment and so sort of seeing my school community come together like that for something that we all love um, and care about so much is definitely something that keeps bringing me to show up um, to do the work. Something that Tree Club at least is working on right now is the um, Bloomberg Fund that was given um, by the city of Boise is around like $50,000 that were given to different high schools for their projects. Timberline is working on a composting project, so we're trying to bring like a pilot program of composting to White Pine Elementary, which is right next to us. Uh, and right now we're sort of in like our early planning stages, but right now we're sort of working on like a media campaign and coordinating with um, custodial staff and admin to try to get the pilot program launched, hopefully in the spring. Um, some other things that Tree Club is doing right now is other media campaigns. One we do um, sort of like an awareness campaign over idling in the, in the school parking lot since so during lunch. Um, everyone idles in their cars, so every week on the announcements we kind of spread awareness about that. And we're going to soon be starting our biodiversity presentations where we go into different elementary schools and get to teach kids about um, just the environment, sustainability, and it's a lot of fun to see them all get excited and learn about the environment. So. Um, I'll introduce Zoe Sims. So Zoe is a junior at Boise High and is also working on many projects. I'm going to let Zoe sum them up, um, but don't forget to tell us what draws you to the work or keeps you motivated um, or concerned, you know, what, what that motivation is. This year at Boise High, which is crazy, um, I would say I'm so passionate about helping the climate because Similarly to Jisong, I have grown up outdoors, um, be it from the grass in my backyard um, to the Sawtooth Mountains. I've lived in all sorts of different places all over the world, and I've been very lucky to see all the beauty that the world has to give us and all the experiences that we can gain and learn. Um, and to me, that's really, really important. I think having outdoors is just so important to everyone's individual development. I actually did a bunch of research earlier this year um, on how green space and just living in areas that have green space around you affects everyone's health. And it's crazy because even living within like areas that have trees lowers risk of hypertension, lowers rates of death, things like that. It has such a big impact on how we live. And I feel like people don't talk about that enough. And so it's really important to remember that and so for me, um, I keep coming back to this subject of climate change because I want to protect the world that I love. So hopefully one day if I have kids or the people around me have kids, they can appreciate and grow up in the type of environment that I would want them to grow up in. Um, so I'm a member of the Boise High Green team. I'm also on the Youth Climate Action Council with Jisong here. And then um, individually, I received a $3,000 grant from the Bloomberg Philanthropies um, Association to do a sustainability outreach project at Boise High. Um, the main focus of our um, outreach program so far has been fast fashion. A little bit of an interesting fact here, but with the clothes that we have on this world today, we could clothe the next six generations of the U.S. of the world population with the clothes that we have today, which is crazy. <laughs> We've so many clothes. And so 
what we've really been working on has been a lot of trying to get information out. And our most recent project with that was we did a clothing drive for our homecoming dance. Um, we collected more than five large trash bags of um, community donations. And then we ended up being able to give away over 40 dresses um, to people in our community, which was huge because not only is that helping with sustainability by reusing and giving your old clothes a new life, but um, it also is a great option for kids who can't necessarily afford to buy a homecoming dress or shoes or jewelry. We had all of those things and that just wrapped up at Boise High for our homecoming dance this Saturday. So that's mainly what I've been working on recently. Yeah. Okay, and I've also um, convinced Susanna to come with us. Susanna's a junior at, Boise, at Bora High School. Um, and when I say convinced, I have to tell you that probably the biggest um, question these guys had was, well, I don't want to miss that much class. How, what brings you to the work? What brought you interested? What keeps you going? And the projects you're working on at Bora. All right, so actually, my name is Susanna Biggs. Um, these wonderful girls here. I grew up outside all the time. I was born into a really outdoorsy family. We went hiking, swimming, camping, all of it. I went on a giant backpacking trip this summer too. Being outdoors is my happy place. So I've always been really passionate about conserving our resources, protecting the environment. And I remember one of my biggest inspirations growing up was Greta Thunberg. She was just, it was so inspiring to see how such a young person could make a massive impact she was recognized by dozens of world nations as this unbelievably, like, oh my gosh, she just, she did so much. Like, she spread so much information about the climate, and I was really inspired. It was like a little 11 year old going, okay, there's a girl my age out here doing this, like, I can do it too. So, one of my biggest projects has been, you know, trying to inspire other kids to know you can also do this. Like, you don't have to sit here and wonder whether or not you can. You can. Um, I'm one of the leaders at the Board Green team, and our biggest project so far have been working on our little community garden. So we have an orchard, we have a bunch of tomatoes and peppers, and we've been still growing this garden for the last, I don't know, say 10 or so years. It's been a really, really big project, and what we're working on right now is installing the drip system so that we can conserve our water instead of watering with the sprinklers and with the hose. So that's our biggest project this year. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we're working on the drip system, and we also do weekly announcements where we talk about like the conservation efforts we're making as a school, specifically the difference between recycling and trash. Because one of the biggest things that teenagers do all the time is throw away the recycling. So <laughs> we started labeling all of the different recycling and trash cans in our classrooms and giving examples of what goes where. So we talk about that in the weekly announcements all the time. Um, yeah. Um, from today about like, okay, it is literally a messy system, but also I do want to mention that um, we've had wonderful collaboration with the city of Boise and with the Curbit program, um, with the Youth Climate Action Council, with all of that amazing outdoor education organizations that are either city organizations or here in um, our area. And we really are working, oh, I should mention Project Green with Blake. I mean, there's, there is amazing partnership for this work. Um, we've also been fortunate to have um, sort of a jump on our energy management from the work with, that we've done with Idaho Power. And while that's specific to electricity, um, it's teaching us a lot about energy management in general and opportunities for efficiency. So um, when we, uh, we would like to mostly take your questions and if you have a question for a specific project, Jason's working with food waste and a lot of the engagement at Timberline, Zoe's working with fast fashion and sustainability engagement at Boise. And then Susanna is working with among other things, the garden um, and student engagement at Bora. Um, I also feel free to ask questions about their experiences in school and some of the you know the other impacts of this because as we've seen from other speakers this morning, um, it is a um, 
central issue to all of us and it is having impacts and we are trying to be strategic with the opportunities to um, make sure that we have healthy, well students in, in a balanced fashion. So um, we're gonna open it up for your questions if anyone wants to get started. You made my day. It's so uh, powerful listening to all three of you. I have three granddaughters and just listening to you. So thanks to all of you. And um, what would you like for parents to do that they are not doing? Not necessarily your parents, but parents <laughs> in general. I know one of you has some parents here. So I'd be curious. Is there something that you say, why in the blank blank don't they do XX? So you can do the XX part. <laughs> you want to start? Okay. Well, um, okay, so this is actually a really good question. One of the things that I feel like is most frustrating as a young person in climate action is that it feels like we have been left with this really, really big problem by a bunch of people who aren't going to live in the world that is the result of their actions, which is so frustrating. I don't even have a word for how upsetting that is. Like, it's it's crazy because I just don't understand how you could how you could see a problem like this happening and not want to contribute to the world continuing forward. It's crazy to me. Um, I have a little bit of a special place in my heart with this one. My dad, Ethan Sims, he's right there, has been probably my biggest motivator in my entire life with any sort of climate action. But he just, he does so many things. But I honestly feel like the best thing that parents can do is start teaching their kids young. I've had a lot of experience nannying this summer for two amazing little girls, and their parents have, um, little storybooks every night about biodiversity, like <laughs> climate change, recycling, all these amazing things, which when introduced from such a young age, like they're out there speaking a lot more about these um, things than a lot of people at my school. And they're just, one of them is what, eight months old now, the other one is four. So <laughs> it doesn't take much, it just takes, you have to spark that passion and also you have to acknowledge, yeah, this is really scary. This is a big thing. This isn't just something that's gonna change overnight, but there are things that we can do to help. I feel like Yeah, I think building off of what Zoe said, I think starting that spark of interest and like passion and then of course um, yes, it's a scary situation, but you have sort of like a role that you can play. You have some control over addressing the problem. I think starting with that spark is super important. And then to take it a step further, I think say um, what parents can do to support like their child is entering like middle or high school, like encouraging them to kind of like get themselves out there in the community and sort of explore what is possible when it comes to um, working with the environment, sustainability, and climate action, because I think um, Maybe off the surface it might seem like there's only like specific niches of what that work looks like, but in, really it's like incredibly diverse. Uh, I know one of my one of my friends who graduated Timberline, but I know when she was younger, she got or when she was in high school, she got involved with the Idaho Climate Justice League, and they do a lot of work with like solar power and like solar, solar energy and like activism around that. And she found that super interesting. So at Tree Club, her and another friend, they started an initiative to get solar panels on Timberland High School's roof, which is super awesome. I know um, last year I was also like working with a conservation conservationist named Dick Jordan, who runs like a Blue Dash genome project where we conduct research on genomic on the genomes of Blue Dash dragonflies and how they're impacted by climate change. And one of my friends who was on the project said that he has always loved dragonflies and insects and overall nature. But he's also really passionate about STEM and science. And so that's why he got involved in research and then doing the research and publishing the paper um, to sort of highlight the impacts of how climate change is affecting these insects. And so, you know, if you're interested in science, if you're interested in like community service or activism, things like that, there's so many things out in the community. And so as a parent encouraging your a child to whatever they're passionate about, I think there's something in the environment that is for them and that's really representative also like kind of why Tree Club has like a lot of different peoples because we do so many different things. Um, sort of doing that is 
so that they can find more passion and interest, but also sort of empower them to have some, like they can play a role in the part, like they can do something to be a part of the solution. Okay, sorry about that. Um, one thing I think is honestly really easy for parents to do is just setting healthy habits. And of course, that can go over so many different subjects. But when we're talking about like conservation, just teaching your kids how to recycle. Teaching your kids what goes where. Of course, I'm kind of biased towards this because it's what we're doing at Bora. Yeah. But it's just, there's so many simple little habits you can do. Like the idling thing that you saw doing with the Timberline. Teaching your kids to turn off the car when you're running into the gas station. There's so many small little things that if your parent just sets a really good example for when you're younger, you're going to pick that up. It's going to be something you do without thinking. It's going to be something that's always in the back of your head because you've learned that habit from your parents. So just setting like small habits, really good examples like that, I think can make a really big difference in an entire generation. So here I come with a prize for your wonderful question. I'm going to follow that up though. Um, well, this is a beautiful bag made by the Capitol High School Green Team, their art contest um, from last year. So it's to save the salmon. So that's you. Yes. Oh, oh, great. Um, but have you taught your parents anything? Can any of you think of a concrete example that your family didn't do and now they're doing? Anybody? No pressure. Sims family. <laughs> I would say for me, Yusuf, so my parents love, like, my mom goes grocery shopping, like, at least, like, three times a week or something, like, she's always getting food, which is, which is great, our pantry's always stacked, but, um, she would always like use a lot of plastic bags and then we we also like reuse our plastic bags by using them as like our trash can liners but it's kind of just like it got to a point where it's super excessive and so um like timberline i'm always just plugging timberline she goes at this point but last year we did like a reusable reusable bag project with albert Finn. so we had an awesome oh yeah you did um we had a really awesome student who designed these bags himself, and then we produced, oh, like, oh gosh, like a thousand or something reasonable bags for our project to be um, sold at a discount at three Albertsons locations. And so, um, because the, we created the bag and the bag was available, my mom, she also goes to Albertsons a lot, so I just gave her some of those bags, and I was like, you can get a discount on your shopping and also, you know, reduce your plastic waste. And then, um, since she didn't have, she, so she didn't have to like keep getting new bags and there weren't just like a ton of plastic bags like stockpiling in the pantry anymore. Um, she started just uh, building the habit of using more reusable bags. So that was super awesome, I guess. Um, the other thing, I learned most of my things from him. Um, however, um, I do feel like the thing that we've been able to teach kind of throughout my family was Oh my gosh, one big thing that we've been um, doing a lot recently is um, thrifted clothing, or if we have things that we're not using anymore, donating it to a thrift store so someone else can use it. That has been something um, that obviously I do a lot. It's very popular at Boise High, but now my mom will go to the thrift store on her way home from work and find a dress for my sister or I. And she'll be, oh, I found the cutest dress here. <laughs> and it makes me really happy to see that because it's, again, a little thing that makes a big difference. Um, and honestly, another thing that I think, like I said, my dad knows a lot of things, but I think having youth climate activists, my sister is additionally also a big activist, but um, I think we've been able to provide a helpful resource for him going into his endeavors. <laughs> um, we traveled to Washington, D.C. with him two years ago to go talk to the Idaho State Senators um, about different climate change initiatives and go to a sustainability conference. I've additionally traveled with him to a few other different conferences, um, one in San Diego this year. And I think it's just, it's important for adults to be able to understand um, youth perspective on it even if they are very well educated on the topic, 
um, they can always learn from what it's like to be the one who's going to grow up in that situation. Focus, they, especially my mom. Okay, she had her reusable Trader Joe's bags she would bring to the store every single time. And she's always been very environmental conscious of her actions. And so is my dad. Um, I, I hate to say what you think, but thrifting was the biggest thing that I really taught my parents, specifically my mom. We'd go out and get coffee, and we'd go to Indie Clover, and we'd sit, and we'd thrift, and we'd talk, and we'd have a little girl bonding moment, and now she thrifts for my brother and for my dad, and my entire closet is thrifted, <laughs> including this whole outfit. Um, but I don't know, it honestly became a really big bonding point between me and my parents. So that would be my biggest thing. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of adults are hesitant or nervous to talk about climate change or climate action in our community. What advice would you give adults um, for like, how do you talk to your friends or your community about climate change? Okay, um, so again, like I said, it's a big and scary thing, which I think is why we have almost a lot of controversy around it. People understand that it's happening, but it's really scary when you understand the full extent of what's happening. It's just, it can feel like this huge, overwhelming thing that no one is going to be able to do, so why even bother? Um, I think the most important thing for me, kind of learning, obviously everyone is learning and growing at all times, but um, I think the most important thing is acknowledging that perfection is not required. Um, I feel like I wind myself up and I'm like, I'll beat myself up because I didn't turn the light off when I left my house. My dad can attribute to this on multiple <laughs> occasions. But it's more, it's, it's doing what you can when you can. It's not about being this perfect climate friendly citizen. There are so many little things that we can do every day that can make a much bigger impact than trying to well, yes, turning your lights off is important, obviously. Sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> it's, you don't have to be perfect to make a difference. And I feel like that's just a really important thing to remember when you're kind of going about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, I would say like, yeah, like what Zoe said, like climate change is such a huge problem. You hear about like the rising sea levels and the melting ice glaciers and the millions of carbon dioxide like emissions that are going up into the air. And it just seems like it's such a huge daunting problem that Zoe mentioned. It's like, oh, what do we do about this? What can we do? Um, I would say when it comes to talking about climate, climate change and climate action, especially to like the more general public or like from the perspective of like uh, as a high schooler to the general high school audience, definitely that small changes or small impacts can compound into really, really significant um, drivers towards the right direction. So like idling in the parking lot, like you can, <laughs> it's very manageable just to turn off your car or if it's hot, um, turn like lower the windows. So you're not obviously gonna like die if you're choking your car or anything. Or, um, composting at home or at schools because when we set the example, so when we're trying to have a pilot program at Wi-Fi, starting composting, then that small change that we make can ripple effect is, oh, if this pilot program is successful, this can set it as an example for other elementary schools to implement it, for middle schools to implement it, for our next door Timberland High School to implement it, and we can have a district-wide composting program going about, and then if we have an example like that, then maybe other states, other schools can get gain the same kind of inspiration. So everything really starts small. And then it also says a lot about you know the power that cities have because we think about global climate change, it's like, oh, how do we what do we do? But if you start on the city level too, you know, with we have like the Bloomberg Fund with the Youth Climate Action Council, things like that, having changes starting from that level I think can make a huge difference. And so bringing that attention to we have things within our reach, within our control that we can do. Um, I think that would be really important. I think that there is a really, really bad problem where we associate opinion 
opinions on climate change with politics and with a lot like what political party you're a part of. The fact of the matter is that it doesn't matter what political candidate you're like you appreciate or whatever, it doesn't matter what party you're a part of. Climate change is real and it is affecting every single one of us. And I think that's part of the reason why people don't bring it up more is because they're scared of starting like a political argument because that's what it always ends up becoming. And I think we really just need to break the cycle of um, fighting against each other and being so divided over politics in order to bring up really important issues like this. You guys are so smart. I, um, do you have another thought, Zoe? Yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry. She, she inspired me. In my environmental science class last year, we learned a little bit on how to talk to people who don't want to acknowledge that climate change is a thing. And a big thing is obviously that a lot of a lot of not believing is rooted in fear. And one way to kind of break that is thus to be like, ah, you don't believe in climate change and point fingers is not getting anyone anywhere. That's treating it like a preschooler, you're gonna get a reaction like a preschooler. Don't there's no reason to expect any different. Um, what we worked on a lot was starting it by sharing something that can feel scary, but that is common ground for both people. So I know for me, um, one thing is skiing at Focus, right? So even if you're just starting a conversation being like, hey man, it really sucks that Focus didn't get much snow this year. Like, I just, I wish that we still got as much snow as we used to get. Something like that where someone can relate and understand that yes, this is happening in my community, this is going to affect me, this is already affecting me. And like Susanna said, not putting a political stamp on it is just so important to just have a conversation as humans, like face to face, like this is civilization and what's gonna happen in the future. And it's not like we don't need to be divided on it because it's gonna affect all of us. It's another thing, sorry. Stop talking <laughs> I could listen to you guys all day. Okay, oh gosh, we're just going to hear from one of each of you. So we can hear a few more questions. How's that sound? Let's see, you want to start? Oh, okay, great. So I'm an IWCF member, and one of our mottos is if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So my question is around. How do you collaborate, if you can give us an example of how you've collaborated to get others to go with you? Just a, a, like a rock solid example of how do you get others to go and do what you're doing? Do you want to take that, Susanna? I would say, yeah. I mean, just kind of displaying for a green team as a club where you're making a difference in the world, you're making a difference in your lives and others is a really important thing because there's so many kids growing up thinking, okay, well, it doesn't matter if I turn off the light, if I unplug the lamp, like, it's not gonna make a difference. Nothing's gonna change. Giving kids an opportunity where they can genuinely make a difference in their lives and benefit the world is by far one of the greatest things you can do if you wanna increase people joining the cause. Because people do wanna change things. People do wanna make a good impact. They want to help the world. They just don't feel like they have any opportunities to do so. The best way of coming together is by showing a very clear path of how we can fix things. Thank you. Hope, um, and that hope is something that can be taught. It's something that can be learned. It's something that you can build in a system, and, that, and the research on that really says it's about having way power, um, and a pathway. So you need a way to get there, and then you need willpower. You need the, the will to go um, towards a goal. And the, the, so it's the way power and the willpower towards a goal to build rising hope. And that is something we really are trying to be intentional with with our, with our students and supporting them. And, and if the pathway doesn't exist, let's mow it, build it, whatever we need to do so that they can move towards hope. My name is Liz. I'm a part of a Rotary Action Team. Last year we did an eco film contest specifically for youth, and I think a lot of you participated, Alison. You were one of our judges. Yes. Thank you. 
And we are about ready to launch it again. We're in the planning stages. How do we market this to teenagers? So again, they'll be creating a short film about the eco solution in the story format and for teens, basically. Okay, this is like, this is my thing. <laughs> um, okay, big one, Instagram. I know that adults don't like it. I understand that. But the thing is, kids will look at it all the time every day, five hours a day, like everyone at school, when they open their phone, Instagram. Like it might, I understand it has its issues, but at least for us with our homecoming drive that we just ran, we did a ton of advertising through Instagram and that was so influential. Boise High has an Instagram, it has, um, and we also have like a weekly newsletter. So we had it on the Boise High Instagram, we had it on like students would repost it on their Instagram. Um, and then people would talk about it at school because of that. Social media is a platform that, like any other tool, it can be abused, but we can also use it to create a lot of change. And I feel like Instagram has been probably the biggest mechanism that we have been using. Um, additionally, I think um, if you're trying to get teenagers involved, talking to teachers and advisors at school, I did a similar um, project. I did one for Veolia um, about water conservation a few years ago. If you saw any ad on KTVB a few years back, I made that. Um, <laughs> pretty cool stuff. But um, a lot of teachers will offer extra credit, which is like a big shiny gold star to <laughs> students at the end of the semester when they've got an 89.49 and they want to get that A. Um, but that's another big thing that I think could be really helpful to implement. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious. Um, I was wondering how much climate awareness or sustainability and solution activism is involved in your required coursework. And then from there, do the clubs and your electives sort of fill that gap if it's not? And then from there, whose responsibility is it to communicate with the rest of the student body and provide that education to everyone? I'm happy to break it down. <laughs> That's a really good question. So I think this would vary from each of us if we all go to different schools. At least speaking from Timberline, awareness, like climate awareness, I would say like none, except for if you take AP Environmental Science. But I also think this does depend on the teacher you might have. Thankfully, our teacher who teaches um, AP Environmental Science and is the tree club advisor, Keith Barnes, he makes sure, he kind of takes the extra step to teach his students about climate awareness, climate change, stuff like that. So I think we're fortunate in that regard, but there's no like there's no math problems that talk about climate change. There's no we don't write any we don't read anything about climate change in our English classes. None of that because they're also not a requirement. And it's really in that sense it's really up to the teachers for bringing that initiative if they want to bring that to the curriculum because as of right now I don't think any like um, core class like English math makes it a standard or requirement to have climate change incorporated into it, unfortunately. Yeah, the way that lives in the standards is um, is in the science standards. So one big misconception is that climate change has been removed from and we're not allowed to teach it in Idaho and that is absolutely not true. It goes all the way down to third grade, third grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, and then high school biology and any of the other geosciences or environmental sciences all have climate in the standard. Um, they also include um, environmental, biodiversity, human impact, all those things. And, and they are in there. Um, I think what we have the opportunity to do is to create more inquiry-based um, frames that we can then, and this is, goes with Sharon and I's work with Boise State Writing Project, has done an amazing job with inquiry-based um, education that allows us to ask essential questions. Um, one that I had a unit on was what is good water? And that is an essential question that, that can can get us to so many things, but that wouldn't have to be a science essential question. That could be a government essential question. That could be, so there's a lot of curricular frames we can bring in pedagogy into that. Um, the standards are set up to support 
Um, and all of our standards in Idaho are also crosswalked with math and ELA standards. So although you may have read articles that make it sound like it's illegal or it's we're gonna get in trouble if we say climate change, et cetera, obviously as an educator, we have to be responsible to how, you know, these, these are very multi-sided issues and any kind of innovation or solution is going to have consequences that may also then lead to other problems. They're gonna have multifaceted societal consequences that we have to look at. What's the impact on the economy? What's the impact on jobs? What's the in impact on um, you know, immigration? All of these things connect, um, and I think our teachers um, need encouragement and support to, to, to take the time for those. Inquiry-based teaching is one way to get at a lot of those issues. Um, but we do have the support and the standards to do so, and, and the media campaign unfortunately kind of won, even though the legislature did not um, necessarily make as dramatic of changes as the media campaign claimed. So if anybody is like wondering about that, I would be glad to talk to you more, and um, let's, let's figure out how, what makes sense so that it can be grounded in good science, good economics, good, um, you know, civil responsibility in, in our uh, curricular system. Thank you for the question. Ethan, I have a question for Chisong. Um, so unfortunately, adults don't always support you in your efforts, and sometimes even get in your way. Um, can you tell us the story of the Timberline Wolfpack, um, kind of what happened to the Timberline Tree Club, uh, and how you guys responded to that really negative situation um, to you know, sort of let adults know how much they hurt your group. Your, your. <laughs> yeah. focus was more on the whole advocacy, but I guess in short and sum, um, Timberline Tree Club, I believe like earlier in early 2000s, we had a wolf pack, and, um, and we teach this in our elementary school presentations too, but we had a wolf pack and unfortunately they got killed. And so um, due to I believe like there's like some there's a law protecting them, but that kind of got repealed or something like that. And then they ended up getting killed, and so we lost our wolf pack. And we're trying to find a new one, and we're trying to sort of like restore that because I mean wolves are the mascot Timberline, um, and but also they're also like wolves hold incredible um, obviously like importance to our ecosystems here in Idaho and overall, and so. We're trying to restore them, and how we've responded as of right now, we have a documentary being made. So earlier this summer, we went to Yellowstone with our film crew, and we got to work with Yellowstone as well to sort of like watch, like the students ourselves get to see the wolves in Yellowstone, and then sort of learn about their history and kind of what we can do in terms of our wolf advocacy efforts. And so our documentary's purpose is to not only bring awareness to the problem and sort of the history, but also what can we do moving forward as youth and um, as our school. And I think kind of the statement as of right now what we're trying to make is, you know, we're not going to uh, take this, if that makes sense. We're not going to just let this problem um, happen and take the blow. We're going to do something about that. And as of right now, we're going to even make a documentary about it. So, yeah. very similar to kind of our closing question was, you know, what do you see for your the future in this work? And, and so I've, you you pretty much just read my mind, so thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Um, for the future, what do you optimistic 
Yes. Yes. So the future and your optimism. What, what are you optimistic for in the future? What do you see in the future if you future cast that? Um, okay, similarly to Susanna, I'm planning on doing something environmental, but I take a little bit of a different view on it. Um, I want to help the people who will be affected by climate change. Um, <laughs> my parents know all about this, they talk about this all the time. I want to be a pediatrician. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of organizations like Doctors Without Borders, um, or even different Red Cross organizations, or organizations similar to that. But um, one of the population areas that are the most impacted by climate change are people who don't necessarily have homes, homeless communities, and also people in um, less developed communities than we do. They don't have an air conditioned house they can go into when it's 120 degrees. They don't have water that's clean that they can access. So what I want to do additionally, oh, sorry, this is another um, thing, but with um, warm, like higher temperatures spreading, rates of infectious disease spreading gets way higher. So my goal is to help people around the world who are affected by that. And I think in the future, I hope to see cover cars um, and electric trains. <laughs> she saw knows all about this. I'm really into electric trains, but um, I think I see a lot of positivity, um, especially just being able to be around people like Jisung and Susanna, um, who are as passionate as I am, and knowing that there are so many other students who are as passionate as I am, who are going to put their best foot forward to do what they can do, um, gives me a lot of faith and hope um, in the future that we have a chance to have. It's just really cool. I guess sort of related to sort of the future uh, career or involvement in climate action. For me, I know I'm definitely interested in pursuing the sort of climate policy side of it. So similar to what Zoe was talking about, the people who sort of face the biggest impacts of climate change are our marginalized, vulnerable communities. And so I know this previous year, I was also on the Youth Climate Action Council, but as a member, and we did a heat mitigation project. And so a big part of the project was sort of looking in Boise and Idaho, um, what areas of the population or which communities are the most vulnerable who don't have proper um, tree cover stuff like that that make them more um, vulnerable to extreme heat during the summer and so considerations like that looking at our histories of maybe redistricting or um, systemic pressures that leave certain communities more vulnerable than others involving that in the policy and then also of course involving communities parents, educators, um, and of course youth in the policy making process so that we're creating um, laws and standards that are best fit for the changing world that we're living in right now. Um, that is something I'm super excited about. And in terms of optimism, I think, um, you know, with the Bloomberg Fund, with the Youth Climate Action Fund given out to students, I think what's super cool is when it shows that when youth are given the resources and opportunities, they will take advantage of it. And you see so many unique projects coming to the table, like Zoe's Homecoming Dress Drive, um, and then um, Timberline's Composting Project, and so many other projects across the school district. It's honestly super awesome to see. And I think it's super cool seeing the trend of more uh, youth getting able to step into leadership roles. Last year also on the council, we had 10 international leaders from different Southeast Asian countries come and reach out to the council wanting to meet with us because they're interested in having their own Youth Climate Action Council. So in Bangkok, um, one of the people there were like, they're interested in starting one and then they wanted to create some kind of, hopefully down the line in like a decade or so, like an international youth climate summit, which is something that we already do in Boise, but this time a lot more countries, which would be really cool. And so I guess that's what gives me a lot of optimism you know, seeing youth who have the passion and have the interest to be involved in climate action, having more and more opportunities to do so. Thank you very much.